Okay. <clears throat> yes, please. Okay, get that going. Thank you all for being here. Um, so there's a lot. There's a lot of new people. So some catching up. This class is just called "Discerning Good and Evil," uh, subtitled "In the Age of Woke." The idea is, oh come on in. <laughs> um, the idea is to be able to identify things that we see in culture and be able to pick them out. So. Today, I'm going to apologize in advance. We have a lot of reading we're going to do, okay? Um, so just bear with me, but it's going to be worth it, I think. Okay, quick review. Things that we've done in some previous classes. Um, number one, we know uh, we have knowledge of good and evil. We get that in the first part of Genesis. We call that the spirit of Abel and the spirit of Cain. Right? So, Spirit of Cain is the evil side. Spirit of Abel is the good side. Christ is the only perfect manifestation of good, as a man, of course. The invitation to Christ must be voluntary, not compulsory. Or compulsory. So, that's very, very key. Individuals are only responsible for their own actions. You good? Just checking on my wife. No big deal. Uh, group identity cannot affect your salvation. Or your innocence, by the way. Your, your guilt or your innocence. There's no, there's no group identity that can do that for you. You are you. And you are responsible for your own actions. So these are things that we've talked about in the past. And therefore, the idea, the, the idea of collectivism, and we've talked about this, we've established that this is the spirit of Cain. This is evil. Individualism is good. Individualism does not save you. It is simply a precondition to become saved. Okay? There's a lot of people that believe in individualism. Not believers, not saved. It is simply a precondition for those of us that do want to be saved. And then we've talked about that the Western world was built on the idea of individualism. That you are on your own, that you are free to choose. We read from a little bit from the Declaration of Independence. That's the whole concept behind it, right? All right. <clears throat> John 8, 31 to 33, and then continuing 44 to 47. Come on in. Yeah. We're packed today. Somebody go tell him to add like 10 more people to my attendance list. 11. 11. She's pregnant. I was talking about Jennifer. I was talking about Jennifer. I know, my goodness. You're in the right class. I'm just going to let this settle. Congratulations. On behalf of the class, collectively. John 8. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been uh, enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Continuing in the 44, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. So these are pretty harsh words, right, for the Jews that he was talking to at that time. By the way, at the end of this passage, do you remember what they did to him? 
This is when they started throwing stones at him at the end of this. So they didn't take this very kindly. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those who uh, those in your charge, but being examples to those of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Continuing. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same, kind, the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Today, I want us to get in the mindset of the devil. Is this church subject to being deceived by the devil? Absolutely. Now, fortunately, we have a couple of elders in here that I have a lot of trust in to make sure that the teaching that we get here is sound and we don't bring in things that are of the devil but I do not have that same belief with other churches. Not, I don't, I'm not calling any specific churches out. I'm simply saying it exists. Okay, So we're going to talk about that today. But before we do that, I, I saw this last night. And I thought, you know, this is only three minutes long. I'm going to play it for you. Some of you may not know who this person is. Many of you will. Who knows who this is? Let me ask who doesn't know who this is. This is Paul Harvey. In 1965, he released this radio broadcast. It's three minutes long. I'm going to play it for you. And it's pertinent to what we're going to talk about today. If I were the devil, if I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness, I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness. And I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree. The. So I'd set about however necessary to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth, I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old I would teach to pray after me, our Father, which art in Washington. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd threaten TV with dirtier movies and vice versa. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction. I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war with themselves, churches at war with themselves, and nations at war with themselves until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions, just let those run wild. Until before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing. I'd have judges promoting pornography. Soon I could evict God from the courthouse, then from the schoolhouse, and then from the houses of Congress. And in his own churches I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas 
a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who wanted until I had killed the incentive of the ambitious. And what'll you bet? I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work, in patriotism, in moral conduct. I would convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that swinging is more fun, that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public, and I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. Paul Harvey. Good day. When was that recorded? 1965. What are your thoughts? Right. Comments? Questions? It's crazy how accurate it is from mm -hmm. 1965 to today when it feels like all of those things are true and more true. Mm -hmm. Everyday living. Mm -hmm. The devil has no new tricks. I mean, it's from the beginning of time. It's We saw it literally in the first part of Genesis with Eve, right? The deception has always been there. And it's easy to be deceived, and you have to continuously just be watchful and keep your eyes open, as we read in that scripture previously. So um, I don't know if it, uh, some of you, I'm sure, had heard that before. Um, I just came across it last night, and I literally just decided to interject it last minute <clears throat> just because... I just think it's a good word, and it is a good reminder that these aren't necessarily all new things that are happening to us, okay? Okay, so last week, just really quick, specifically around last week, um, we talked, we went back to the Frankfurt School. We're not going to go do that again. If you want to see what we did last week, we did a whole history of this. Frankfurt School was neo-Marxism, which was essentially the same thing as what we call critical theory. Critical theory is a framework of thinking that actively analyzes and relentlessly critiques existing social structures and power dynamics with the goal of identifying and challenging inequalities sorry, uh, <clears throat> uh, to bring about social change. It essentially questions the status quo and seeks to understand how systems might be oppressive to certain groups, aiming to dismantle them and create a more equitable society. This is critical theory. Okay, and those of you who were here last week, we talked about how you separate those two words, you put a blank in the middle, and you can put any word you want in between them. So last week, we specifically talked about critical race theory. We got into the history of that, some of the details, the people behind it. What are their ideas? What is it that they want? I got this definition from James Lindsay, a faith system founded on the belief that a fundamental organizing principle of Western society is racism created by white people for the benefit of white people. And their goal is to raise consciousness of your participation in systemic racism that keeps black and brown people down. This is what CRT teaches, okay? So, that we, we established the history behind it last week. We talked about what it is. We, we connected it. We connected the dots to the spirit of Cain, okay? Collectivist mindset, This is these are people who believe that group identity is ahead of individual identity, and it's your group identity that is more relevant to you as a person. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the church. Because this doesn't get into the churches, right? Thankfully, not this church. But it, it has gotten into others, and it has corrupted other churches. So... This is Letitia Morrison. She wrote a book called Be the Bridge. The book turned into a curriculum, okay? They have a training curriculum. This is from their website. This, I took this uh, screenshot last night. I bought their training. I paid money because I wanted to see what was in it. So, sorry, honey. <laughs> It was really hard to do, for the record. You did it, so we will have it. I did it. I, this, is, this is my uh, contribution to you guys. 
Okay, <clears throat> so it's basically you pay, you get this downloadable PDF, you learn how to be a bridge builder. The first thing I want you to notice is how pleasant it all sounds, okay? You, you probably already know where I'm going to go. You probably already know I'm not going to like this. But I want you to pay attention to how they, the language they use to draw people in because it's very hard to say, well, that's not good or that's a bad thing. Like, it's very difficult to do so. So we're going to read through some of it. So let's look at the goals of the guide. For God to be glorified. Check. No problem there. For the church to be credible. Great. For Christians to develop biblical tools that empower them to be the bridge between people divided by racial and cultural differences and thereby bring healing and transformation to communities. Okay. I personally see a few uh, words in that statement that caused me hesitation. Red flags go up, if you will. Maybe yellow flags go up. What words might those be? Transformation. There, that's one of them. That's one of them for sure. So I, I see that word. Nothing wrong with the word transformation. But you see that in context, you start to go, oh, right, you know, flag goes up. You start to need to pay more attention. What else? Racial. What's that? Racial. Racial? Potentially. Potentially, yeah. I would say that phrase, divided by racial and cultural. Okay. I just struggle with Christians being healing and transformative. Like, that's not us. We can't be. Yeah, correct. Like, by definition, that's Christ. Yes. Okay, well, this is one of the more mild ones, okay? We're going to get into some. And by the way, I, I'm just going to give you guys a heads up. I already had to have a talk with Clint this morning, and I told him, Clint, you need to zip your lip today. Not really. He, he can talk. I'm just kidding. But here's the thing. There's going to be, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to read through some of this actual content. And here's what I want from you guys. I want you guys to look at this and do what we just did and find these words that are, well, I'm just going to say they're unbiblical the way that they're using them, right? And the reason I told Clint is because he's going to see all the same ones I see. So he almost like he's got the answer cheat uh, in, his, in his head. Contents. Here's, all, here's their layout. I'm just putting this up there really quickly. Um, these are the different sessions that you're going to go to if you attend this curriculum. Uh, session one, awareness, acknowledgement and lament, shame and guilt, confession, forgiveness, repentance, reparation. Interesting. Restoration and reproduction. We're not going through the whole thing today. There's a few pieces I have called out that we're going to, we're going to look through. Ronald, that, yeah, it, it already implies that everybody's guilty of being a racist in, in this training mm -hmm. from, from page one there. Mm -hmm. you, you're making my heart happy, Cody. <laughs> you're starting to get it. But... Sure. <laughs> all right, so this is, and, and all of these are screenshots. I did, I, uh, they locked the PDF down, so you can't uh, copy and paste the text, which I was going to try to do. So everything is screenshot. So. I'm not taking anything out of context. I'm not deleting anything. It's a screenshot, which also means some of the sizes are weird. But um, <clears throat> they use John 17, 23. I am in them and you are in me. May, the, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Okay, fantastic. I'm not going to tell you I disagree with Scripture. Uh, the way that they set this up, okay? So then they start with, the journey toward racial unity is not an easy process, okay? Did we have slavery in history? Yes. Was it wrong? Were people oppressed? Absolutely. Okay, I'm hooked in. Let's talk about this, right? Yes, it's not going to be an easy process. It can feel daunting to dive into the unknown abyss of racial conversations. It takes courage to move toward what is uncomfortable and unnatural. Many of us look around and see racial divides. Things feel stuck, and we want to do something. So far, so good, right? We have read the scripture and prayed for unity, but how do we, the body of Christ, actually become one? How do the words of John 17 come alive in each of us and in our communities? How does unity begin to permeate our entire being? How do we become light uh, in the dark 
world full of racial division? How do we become a witness and a voice for racial unity? Okay, so far, I'm good. I'm locked in. I like it. There's, not, there's no problems yet, right? The purpose of this discussion guide is to help us get unstuck. It is designed to facilitate conversations that have potential to heal racial divides. A first step in our collective journey toward racial reconciliation. This guide will aid you uh, to navigate conversations and work to build relationships. Our ultimate goal is to achieve racial reconciliation as a reflection of our ministry of reconciliation in Christ. The concept of racial unity Many differently shaped, differently functioned body parts coming together to form a single unified body of Christ provides a foundational framework for the work we must do to achieve this goal. Okay, there's one word or phrase in there that I have a big problem with. Which, which part of it do I raise big red flags for me? What's that? No, and it's not that one per se, although in context I have a problem with it, but I, so far I'm trying to go with their context. Jerry? All right, the, the, the part that I'm bothered by is this word collective journey. Remember, we talked about collectivism, okay? The word collective is not a problem, but when I see collective journey, I immediately start to realize, oh, this is what they're talking about. They're not talking about this as an individual problem. They're talking about this as a group problem. And as soon as you flip it to become a group problem, well, then there's no way to reconcile a group problem. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's, let's give them a chance. Like, let's listen to what uh, Letitia says. Session three, shame and guilt. They pull from Ezra 9, 5 to 6 as their scripture. I stood up from where I had sat in the morning with my clothes torn. I fell to my knees and lifted my hands to the Lord, my God, and I prayed, Oh my God, I am utterly ashamed. I blush to lift up my face to you, for our sins are piled high, <clears throat> piled higher than our heads, and our guilt has reached to the heavens. Okay. Once again, this is scripture. I have no problem with it. I'm trying to remember if I put in here the, the example. We'll get to it. There is a problem with this, the way that they're going to use the scripture. We'll get to it. I'm just trying to remember if I put it in here or not. So, The background, the steps of awareness and acknowledgement and lament of racism and racial injustice can generate uncomfortable feelings of shame and guilt. In our individualistic flags go up, in our individualistic and therapeutic culture, shame and guilt tend to be regarded with suspicion or as tools for controlling others. Viewed this way, they can hinder the process of relational restoration. In the Bible, however, shame and guilt are much more. I should pause here and ask Dale, Dale, is it true that shame and guilt can be used to manipulate people Continues on. Go ahead. The first sentence, I mean, is like the roadmap of what they're trying to do. They're trying go back one that one slide, don't mind. So they're gonna make you aware and they want you to acknowledge it and then lament and bring on that shame. It's like this 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 can generate is is we're wanting you to generate this uncomfortable feeling. I'll shut up. Yeah. Oh you, no, keep going. That I, I love it, I love it. Okay, she continues. Western morality is based on individual guilt and innocence. Parentheses. For instance, a person who obeys the law is good, but one who breaks law is bad and deserves to be punished. It reflects the assumption that the individual is the primary unit and source of identity, accountability, and status. For this reason, people from individualistic cultures struggle to grasp the concept of collective shame or a morality based on communal honor or where individuals share responsibility in the preservation of communities' integrity and reputation. 
communal honor exists somewhere, somewhat in American culture. If your toddler pushes a kid at the park, for example, you apologize on his or her behalf. If a father makes a scene at a high school football game in front of his daughter and her peers, she feels embarrassed. In general, however, the communal shame is aroused beyond the level of familial association, which frequently happens in conversations about racial inequity. It is, a rapidly countered, it is rapidly countered with proclamations of individual innocence. Quote, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not a racist. The following story illustrates cultural differences in a way that people uh, handle collective shame and guilt. Okay, we'll stop there. We'll get to their story in a second. Somebody help me with that. Is it true that if your child goes and pushes another child, you go apologize to the other parent or whomever? Is that true? Yes. Sometimes. Why? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. I make my kid go say sorry. So yeah, that's on Good. Page. Yeah, they just depend on their age. They're two and not able to say I'm sorry and they didn't understand what they actually did right. wholeheartedly, then yeah, I would... I'd wear them out and then I'd tell them not to do that. But, and I'd I'll, I'll edit that part out of the video. <laughs> you can put it in there. Okay, our goal, is to, our goal is to teach our kids to love and love others. And so hopefully that example yeah. starts a conversation with them. And they may be too young. And so you're like, okay, here, let me curb some of these behaviors. But the goal is not to just constantly correct, but to teach them love and to act from love. Yeah. Clint. Parents also have a responsibility to raise their kids. Correct. So when their kids are acting out of order, it's, it is reflective upon the parents, and their parents might have something to apologize for themselves, yeah. in addition to for their kids' behavior. But yeah. a good parent's going to encourage their kid to apologize as well. Your, your role of a parent uh, is an assumed responsibility where your child is not necessarily always acting on their own behalf, right? Um, now, let's extend this beyond family. We have John and Clint at this congregation, they're elders. If somebody, and I'm not going to come up with some crazy, but if somebody were in this congregation were to go do something to harm others willfully and intentfully, and um, it was very destructive to several people, as elders of this congregation, they might have a feeling of shame and guilt. Why? Because they have a responsibility for the flock of this congregation. Now, we, I told you we're going to get to uh, hierarchies in the future. We're not there yet. But we have to understand that the way that this is being used is use, they're trying to manipulate the mind and to change it from a status of responsibility to a status of ownership over something that you have no control over, such as literally the way that God made you. It's very different, the way that they're thinking about this. So... Hey, Ryan, the, the verse in Ezra that they're referring to is literally the uh, message that we heard this morning, being separated from the world. The children of Israel were taking on all of the kind of pagan practices, mm -hmm. and so they were kind of looking like them. And so Ezra says that guilt and shame comes from that, not from something like this. So I, I feel like the association is immediately broken at the beginning. Yeah, I, I would agree. And... and from Ezra's perspective, there's a feeling of like responsibility that goes along with that. And so that's the why behind it. By the way, does it mean that Ezra doesn't have a chance of going to heaven? Like, if somebody at this congregation does something horrible, does it affect the elder status as the ability for them to be saved, right? You can have that feeling, and the same with your kids. They can do something, does not make you responsible for what they did, even if you might have that sense of, man, I should have been more responsible in that situation. So... In January 20, this is the story. Remember they said the story illustrates it? It's, well, I, I just need to reserve my comments. Let you guys, I'm trying to let you guys see it. In January 2017, Sam something, uh, a Ghanaian television personality living in South Korea, shared his experience of racism in the country on the Korean talk show, As You Say. One of the co-hosts responded, I'm embarrassed. The co-host next to him said, I feel so sorry. The third chimed in, I am sorry. The immediate response of the Korean co-host uh, co was empathy and apology rather than condemnation of the specific people who had mistreated Sam. Their responses reflected an ethnic based on communal honor. As a country, South Korea had failed, 
as a country, South Korea had failed to exercise appropriate hospitality to Sam, and the Koreans collectively bore that dishonor. Uh, did they? <laughs> Given a similar situation, Americans would not likely feel dishonored as Americans do their perceptions of individual guilt or innocence, thinking those people were guilty of racism, but their behavior doesn't reflect poorly on me. Okay. I'm going to reserve my comments. What are your guys' thoughts? First of all, are we talking about uh, any of these Western countries? <laughs> so there's, I mean, they're, they're trying to take an association of the cultures of other countries that were not built on the Western society of individualism. So these are literally societies that have collectivism built into their systems. So that's the first problem I have. Second problem I have is there's a lot of assumptions going on here about the whole uh, country of South Korea bearing communal shame for whatever this guy experienced. So my response to this is just, it's a complete false premise. It's used to draw you in. It's used to make you like, oh yeah, that's so true. Oh, just like the child thing. Oh yeah, of course I would go apologize for my child. This is to draw you in. It's to make you start to think that what they're about to tell you is the way to go about it. Although communal shame brings great distress here, it is part of a redemptive arc. For both Ezra and Daniel, shame is not associated with fear or punishment, or fear of punishment, or the need to establish personal innocence. It is about recognizing the opportunity to initiate communal restoration as members of a group. They assume the responsibility of confessing and seeking reconciliation on behalf of the entire group. The possibility of communal restoration through communal identity and repentance increases the ways we can achieve justice and restore peace between estranged ethnic groups. Thoughts? What are some words that pop out here? Communal. Communal. It's like, I don't know, was it five times in there? It's a lot. Dale? The, it's the word right after that communal restoration. Uh, you know, what what is their what is their goal when they when they get when she accomplishes what she intends? What is it going to look like? I know what it looked like when Paul wrote to the Hebrews <laughs> and pointed out to them. You know, your your communal uh, restoration is not going to save you. Just because you're a Jew, uh, you know, and in Romans too. Yeah, in Romans too, exactly. <laughs> yep. I mean, that if 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 the goal is to is to be the people of God because we are, just because of who we are, you know, when we when or where we were born, how how does that impact me as an individual? Well, as long as I call myself a Jew, or as long as I call myself a member of this group. I'm good to go, you know, uh, and that you know, removes individual responsibility and individual uh, culpability, I guess. Yeah. So I, I want to know what their what their vision of this is, and I have a sneaking suspicion it's going to be how everybody looked after a struggle section session in China. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Which, yeah, I know if, if he just talked about struggle sessions in China, that sounds like it's just some term. It was a thing. We're gonna we'll we'll at some point get to that and what those actually were, the historical significance of an actual struggle session. You want to talk about actual dunce hats and actual flogging in front of thousands and thousands of people? That's what China China did in Mao's China in nineteen fifties. Did you have something? Yeah, and I'm kinda of going off what you were saying where like communal talking about communal all the time and everything, and it's one, what's her definition of it? Like what is she saying? Because there's like the, as a church, we're a community and everything, but then, mm -hmm. like, it's saying. I mean, the answer is she's talking about race. She's talking about black and white. I mean, there's other ways to do it, and it's not. That's not the only way. When I talk about woke, they're going to do this in many, many, many different ways. We haven't got to intersectionalism yet. That's going to be a fun one. But in this particular instance, it's race. It's how God tinted your skin 
when you were born is what she's talking about. Yes, so, but what I mean is that you said that she's, you know, she's saying that there's one, you know, as a community, like she's misusing the term community, you know, she's putting that in, I don't know. He, he, I think what he's trying to say is that white people don't form a community mm -hmm. and black people don't form a community, mm -hmm. right? So it's, you, you're saying that she's yeah. she's describing community characteristics yeah. to groups that actually aren't communities. Yep. And to an individual. So uh, last week, um, if it helps at all, I talked about uh, they operate under different operating systems like Windows and Mac. Okay. The way that you and I define community is one operating system. They operate under a completely different operating system. They don't think that way. They actually do ascribe community to that, those types of things. So that's the, the thing that you have to understand is they come at it from a very, very different perspective. So, um, I have a comment. Yeah. yeah. I think the, the biggest piece of irony that I see in this whole thing is that the scripture that she takes to then say Ezra um, is uh, taking this as an opportunity to initiate communal restoration between estranged ethnic groups when he's literally shamed that they're intermarrying, two ethnic groups are intermarrying. So just, I find that very ironic. And we can go from there. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're, you're touching on a little bit of what where all of this eventually breaks down is you have to start getting into now let's do, get a color chart of skin color because you're you're going to be it, it you can't you just you just can't do it it doesn't work right and that's kind of what you're touching on a little bit um so just for time i'm going to skip to session seven so congratulations you've you've graduated to session seven <laughs> Because reparation, they take from Philemon, and this is such a, I mean, we're, we're really go-go gadget arms because we're really stretching on this. Um, I appeal to you to show kindness to my child, Onesimus. I became his father in the faith where he is in prison. Onesimus hasn't been much of much use to you in the past, but now he is very useful to both of us. I am sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. Remember, this is the only scripture they could come up with to talk about reparation. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you could welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. Paul, I write this with my own hand. I will repay it, and I won't mention that you owe me your very soul. <laughs> Do you see the stretch here? That They're using that to make a claim for reparations. So what do they want with reparations? With every successive uh, session, we have explored an additional layer of requirements, requirements for true reconciliation between estranged groups to take place. So far, we have covered awareness, acknowledgement, lament, shame and guilt, confession, forgiveness, and repentance. I'm really proud of you guys. The next step is for wrongdoers, just think of that for a second. Wrongdoers, I can't, it's just, it's so hard to not comment. Uh, to work together with those who have been wrong in order to make things right. Since unjust events can sometimes feel historically distant, another way to say this is that those who have inherited the power and benefits of past wrongdoers must work together with those who have inherited the burdens and vulnerabilities of those who were victimized. This process is called reparation. Merriam-Webster defines reparation as the act of making amends, offering uh, expedi expiation, or giving satisfaction for the wrong or injury. It is the work of repairing the relationship between individuals and communities that have been broken by injustice, including racism. If you are wondering if they're talking about money, while reparation is a term we don't often hear outside of activist circles, it is a thoroughly biblical concept. We find specific instructions about reparation woven throughout the Mosaic civil laws and stories about restitution sprinkled throughout the scripture. 
almost always restitution involves not only repayment of an amount owed, but also payment of an additional fee or percentage. Take Numbers 5 to 7, for example, where God tells Moses what the people must do when they do wrong to another person. If you don't see how she's flipping things back and forth here, uh, they must confess their sin and make full restitution for what they have done, adding an additional 20% and returning it to the person who was wrong. The Hebrew root for the word reparation in God's instruction to Moses is shwab, and is used to close uh, to, is close to 1,000 times throughout the Old Testament. Okay, I just said that she's flipping things around. What is she doing? She's using individual rules to apply to whole groups of folks. And so, why does somebody... I go back to, if somebody gets into this kind of stuff, they have to start with a different mindset. And that's why we talked about collectivism and individualism so much. Because that is the core belief behind this. She is applying an individual's actions and responsibility to that of a collective. Okay? You're, you're trying to operate a, a Mac operating system on a Windows computer. It doesn't work. But she's doing it very intentionally in front of our own eyes. And a lot of people fall for this. That's the problem. A lot of people fall for this. Did you hear something? Yeah, so I have an observation just with all her language and everything like that. She definitely is. This is the thing like with things like critical race theory and wokeism and everything as a whole. The whole Marxist idea is all that. Is a lot of it is an inversion in a corruption of Christian morals, a lot of it, because a lot of, you know, it's it's conflating saying these things, that it, it's adding that moral aspect to it, that, yes. oh, because, you know, you're white, and in the past, you know, white Americans were racist and were, had slaves, Some, or, yeah. and, you know, did things like the Indian Removal Act and everything like that. Because of that, you're culpable for it. You have this original sin that you're born because of your skin. And so, no. As yep. salvation for repentance, that's re reparations is part of that. And another part of it is, you know, being ashamed of who you are, being ashamed of. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead um, because think about teaching our kids this because in, in a lot of public schools, thankfully not as much in our area, but in other areas of the country, this is very, very prominent teaching to kids who don't understand how to decipher these types of things. Um, I'm going to skip ahead because, um, yeah, I mean, you get the idea about reparations. Uh, she's conflating it. So little known fact, um, if you get this, you also get a pamphlet <clears throat> that you get to have to learn about if you're white and you're going to attend one of these sessions, they ask you to go through this before you attend a session. So this is this is handed over, right? Whiteness 101. So you, you as a white person, if you're going to attend these uh, classes, you need to read through this. The contents of this document, just going to the steps, step one is developing a white identity, acknowledging your white privilege, overcoming white fragility, and recognizing white supremacy. Uh, close your eyes and picture a racially reconciled body of believers. What do you see? The image in your mind might resemble what the Apostle John described in Revelation 7, 9. I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne before the Lamb. What an inspiring picture. There is no homogenous group, but rather a colorful collection of communities. Great. Like, I'm on board with all of what she's saying here. There's no, no problems. Actually, I, uh, I don't know who wrote this because this is written all from a perspective of a white person. Um, so I don't think that Letitia wrote this. We're going to pop through it really quickly here because I want you to see what this says. Uh, as white people, we often want to jump into the work of racial reconciliation with guns a-blazing, ready to speak out and fix everything. But we must learn that our first step is to engage in the discipline of quiet self-reflection. In other words, you need to be quiet. You're not allowed to speak because of the color of your skin. Okay, that's what she's saying. 
Uh, they have a glossary of terms, which is helpful because I don't have to make up the ethnicity. They do implicit bias, people of color. I cannot tell you how much I despise the term people of color. If you are using it, please stop using it. It is inherently racist because there's no other uh, group that is not a person that, like, it's just, the, the phrasing itself is just racist. Whites are good. Well, that's true. We're not like translucent, right? I mean, we're, um, oh, well, when I get in the sun, I'm kind of, um, they define prejudice, race, racism, white people. That's fantastic. Great. Um, I want to get into this because it, I had a lot more here and I apologize. We're not going to get to it. And I don't want to spend another week on this. I want to move on to something else. Uh, developing a white identity. If you were uh, to write down five words to describe yourself, how likely would you be to include white on that list? Highly unlikely, right? This is because to be white in America is to be part of a dominant or default culture. It is quite common for us to grow up as white people believing we don't have a culture. Culture is what other groups of people have. We admire their colorful dress, their spicy foods, their exotic sounding language. We don't feel, we don't have anything special. We're just quote unquote normal. For instance, and they did, they get into this hair care thing. Um, this stuff, you can't get hair care materials at, at Target or Walmart or whatever. And that's just a, that's just a, um, a, a, a result of majority identity is really what it is. I mean, if there's two people out of a hundred that have a certain need for a product, you're not going to try to sell that product to the two people. You're going to sell it to the 98. That's a majority problem. It has nothing to do with race. But they turn it into race, by the way. Uh, developing a healthy white identity does not mean drowning in white guilt or reveling in white pride. It is essentially it is essential we learn or rather unlearn our history and acknowledge the role we have played in the oppression of people of color. So it's not if we have, it's the role that we have played. Uh, acknowledging white privilege. This is the big one for me. Um, I remember... Years ago, I started hearing this white privilege thing, and I was like, something's wrong with that. But I never had the way to articulate why it was so evil. Imagine ascribing a moral code, moral um, moral superiority to somebody based on the way that they were born, and then teaching that to them. Like, there cannot be a more evil way of living. And I, I said this to somebody last week. Uh, it was actually after class, so I didn't say it in class, but... Um, the ideology that gives us this, by the way, is the exact same ideology that led us to slavery in the first place. Like we, they are, it's the same collectivist <laughs> ideology that looked at black people and said, they are nothing more than slaves to me. They are not worth, right? The ideology of individualism and Christians that who, who were against it and said, Hey, no, those are souls. Those are people. We should free them. The same ideology that puts slavery into place is the same ideology that puts this garbage out. And that t teaches white people that you have white privilege. And you, there is no way to get around it, by the way. It's a lifelong process of repentance and reconciliation. You cannot get out of it. Um, and I know we're running out of time, but last week we talked about Peggy Backintosh. You see there in the first sentence, remember her? She wrote The White Privilege back in 1988. Um, Last paragraph there. Until we see and understand that privilege comes with our whiteness, which is property, we cannot accomplish the necessary work of dismantling this unjust system of advantage. Dale said a little bit ago, what is your ultimate goal? Without, uh, I'm just going to go to my conclusion. I don't, I don't have all the slides to prove it to you, but we're out of time. And like I said, I want to move on from this. What is our system in America built on? What is our economic system? How do you end systemic anything in this country? You have to start over. You have to uproot it. These are Marxist, communist ideas, and that is what they want. They want to uproot this system. They want to transform our capitalist, individualist society the society that says you get the freedom of religion, the freedom of worship who you want to worship, they want to uproot that. That is their goal. 100% that is their goal. And they do it by putting Scripture against it, 
and manipulating other Christians to say this is something that we ought to, as Christians, be for. Uh, Clint, I can see you look like you're... They'll even admit it. They will go on record saying that that's our goal, but there are a lot of useful idiots in this world. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for the time of today. I'm going to move on from this. I don't know what we're going to get into next week, but um, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. So, <laughs> all right, thank you all.